Good afternoon folks, welcome back to Advanced Art Chemistry. I would like to tackle what these things are today um, and how they link to the last two apparently random concepts that I threw you in the last video which was date of bonding and the oxidation number or oxidation state of a transition metal. If you remember these two, data bond was like a normal covalent bond except both of the electrons that make up that bond had come from one source. And if you remember this, this was effectively the charge that the transition metal would have had in a complex ion if it was by itself. Um, a classic example of that, that we looked at last time is Mn7+, plus. manganese 7 plus. You can't have a plus 7 charge on a bare ion, and indeed you can't. And that's why it teams up with four oxygens and the whole thing gets wrapped up together in a little bundle. Because in fact, that is an example of this. So a transition metal complex has a center transition metal ion and attached to it are a variety of organic molecules. And they attach to the transition metal, of course, by dative bonds. Um, and the oxidation number on the transition metal can change the property of this complex. So we'll start with a question. Um, what do hemoglobin in your blood, uh, chlorophyll in my plants here, and shower shine that you hopefully use in the shower in the morning to apparently keep it sparkling clean? All three of these things have something in common. Um, let's answer that by the end of the video. The transition metal complexes have a variety of obscure and very specific vocabulary. Um, and the first of these examples of vocabulary I'm going to throw at you is this. A ligand, which always sounds vaguely, vaguely piratical to me. You know, a they my hearties, you bunch of ligands. That's just in my mind, of course. Um, so we'll move on from that. Yeah, don't worry, I'm getting therapy for it. Um, and we'll have a look at what the definition of it. You can hear my wife laughing in the background. Uh, you can hear my definition of what a ligand is. A ligand is this organic molecule here, which attaches to the transition metal ion and forms the whole thing, which is a complex, by date of bonds. The SQA, in their infinite wisdom, uh, would like you to be aware of the following molecules that can act as ligands. They want you to know um, about the... Let's number them down here. H2O, that's an example of a ligand. Um, NH3, ammonia. The halogens, which we'll just call X with a minus charge. So that's the halogen ions. Uh, cyanide, which we haven't come across much. Uh, that's actually a triple bond there, and there's a charge on it. So cyanide is actually an ion. You'd have something cyanide, like potassium cyanide. Um, and hydroxide. OH minus. And lastly, they want you to be aware of a slightly more obscure one. Uh, this is a hangover from the bad old days of chemistry. They want you to be aware of something called the oxalate ion. Now, an oxalate ion looks like this. Double bond O, negative charge, double bond O, negative charge. It's actually the negative ion of a dicarboxylic acid. That started off as OH on there and OH on there. Uh, this is the oxalate ion. And again, you would have two positive ions counterbalancing it. So sodium oxalate would be Na2. And then the formula of this guy here is C2O4, with two minus charge, of course. You find it in rhubarb leaves. Oxalic acid is in rhubarb leaves. That's why we eat the stems and not the leaves, because this is a little bit on the poisonous side. But all of these molecules here are all ligands. In other words, they can form dative bonds to transition metal ions. How do they do that magic? Well, I'm hoping that for some of them, the, the minus charges, you can probably see how they would bond onto this. But guys like water and ammonia don't appear to want to join the party. They seem to be neutral, and they are neutral. But they have got something that I haven't told you about yet. It's upcoming in the future. They've actually got pairs of electrons which are free to be involved in data bonds. Can I cast your minds back all the way to S3 where we used to do easy stuff, eh? Let's draw a molecule, just for a second like we used to. Oxygen. Uh, and a couple of hydrogens here. The old Mickey Mouse representation. Um, and then we can put circles for the electrons for the oxygen, although we know it's not quite as simple as that anymore. Uh, one, two, 
three, four, five, six. If you had a much neater teacher than me at National 5 and 4th level, you would have probably had the teacher gather them together in little pairs. Now, now we sort of know why, because that's meant to be a representation of an orbital, and so is that. But my point is that these electrons here are available to donate themselves onto this transition metal and form a nice date of bond, often represented by an arrow, which is why I've done arrows there as well. So that's why water can be a ligand, and I'm hoping that you can work out in your head that ammonia can also fall into the same category, because ammonia has three hydrogens on it, of course. By the way, before you leave the course, we will answer the question of why they are these weird shapes. Um, they being the molecules here. Why are they simply not flat? Why do they bunch up into pyramids or V-shapes? One, two, don't let me get distracted. You know what I'm like. There we go. So ammonia has got that pair of electrons which can, again, form a data bonk onto there. Complete the sound effects there. So these guys can all be ligands. And a ligand is just an organic molecule which can bond datively onto a transition metal and form a complex with it. Excuse me, I've run out of paper. I'm going to check it out here and use somebody else's resources for a change. Uh, I'm, because Scholar has got some lovely diagrams compared to my scrappiness. Just two seconds, sorry. I'm already running there. This is it. <laughs> no, sorry, it's no problem. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, we've got uh, ligands and transition methods. This is from the Scholar PDF notes, guys. Uh, and they go through basically what I did in the last page. Um, but I'm going to throw word number two at you now. Um, which is uh, this word here, which you probably can't make out because it's quite small, and it's dentate, as in teeth, yes, dentate. So a dentate is like the number of attachment points that a particular ligand can stick to the transition metal with. If we spin back to my original diagram, uh, I made it look like there was a single molecule attaching each one, so that looks like there's four ligands there, which is true for simple ones, like these guys, but I threw this oxalate ligand at you, and you can see... I drew it that specific way. I didn't draw it just all clustered together because if you have a look at how they've shown oxalate here, the oxalate ion can actually attach onto the metal ion at two different points. And so can this. Um, this is ethylene diamine, as in eth two carbons and diamines group. And you've got two lone pairs, so these can form two separate data bonds onto the center ion. Once again, their diagrams are much nicer than mine. So I can show you their diagrams. I've lost, but there we go. Um, actually, no, let's not check it out completely. Let's try and... So what's my point then? Um, if these are called monodentate ligands, where they've only got a single attachment point, these are bidentate ligands, as in two-teeth ligands. Um, how would that work out? Well, let's say we had a transition metal. Uh, let's pick, I don't know, say iron. And uh, iron can have six different things attached to it in a tetrahedral pattern. So let me bear with me while I try and draw tetrahedral. These are like the axis points, and then we'll have disappearing away here, coming out of the page, disappearing away here. If you see, that's meant to be the center square, and then that's the two points of the equatorial. I mean, something like this, guys, sorry. Something like that. Um, but my point being that the oxalate ions, because they've got two attachment points, and so there's this ion here, this ligand, sorry, this ligand here. Uh, this is an ion, this is a neutral. Uh, they're both ligands, though, because they're just about to attach themselves onto this iron. And we can do it like this. We can have an oxygen on here, and it was attached to a carbon, and there was another carbon, and then there was an oxygen on here. These are O minuses, and then the double bond sticks out to space. So that takes care of those two points nicely. And then we can have a similar structure here. An oxygen, an oxygen. And lastly, oxygen, oxygen. And there's our complex. So we've got an iron ion. Let's give it a charge. What charge do we fancy for the iron? Let's pick into some three, three plus. Um, so this is our whole complex here, guys. 
We've got one iron and we've got three molecules of this oxalate, which is a bidentate ligand because it can attach at two separate points. What would this complex look like if we just attached waters to the iron three? Well, it's at this point I wish I had can copy and paste. Hold on two seconds. I can. Let's not waste your life watching me copy and paste things. So there's another iron three. Uh, and we can attach waters to it, for example. This is actually what happens when you put iron three ions in a glass of water, by the way. Uh, the water doesn't simply... We didn't go into this last year in much depth, but the water doesn't simply ignore your ions. Of course it doesn't. They're positive. So we've got like little water molecules at each of these attachment points forming dative bonds onto the iron. In this case, we have six water molecules. And these are all dative bonds. So that's what you actually get when you dissolve, say, iron three chloride in water. You get a complex forming between the water molecules and the ions. Water's incredibly complex <laughs> stuff, sorry. Had to be done. Had to be done. Um, where do I want to go next with this? Well, can I just reinforce the, the, the vocabulary so far? Um, water is a ligand because it's able to form a dative bond onto the central ion. Water is a monodentate ligand because it only attaches at one point. This oxalate ion is a bidentate ligand. And can you get anything above bidentate? You certainly can. Let me show you. A diagram from um, Scholar again. This bad boy here is a hexadentate ligand, which has got six attachment points. One, two, three, four obvious ones because they're negatively charged, and five, six little lone pairs of electrons on the nitrogen. Um, and this is what it does to the central metal ion. It wraps itself around completely. So we've got six attachment points, in this case, the ratio of nickel to ligand is actually one to one. Whereas here we had a ratio of iron to ligand of one to three. And of course here we've got one to six. Uh, that ratio changes depending on how many attachment, how many biting points you've got, your dentate points on the ligand. Shapes of complexes, just for relief. Oh, last, the last uh, new bit of vocabulary, coordination number. The coordination number is the number of bonds that is attached to the central metal transition metal ion. So if I pick my third colour for today, let's go with uh, green. Why not? Um, people get mixed up between the coordination number and the dentate number. Um, the easiest way to determine the coordination number is once you've got a nice picture of your complex like that, just draw a circle round the transition metal and count how many bonds you cut through, literally. So the coordination number of this complex here is 6, which is exactly the same as the coordination number of that complex there, and in fact, precisely the same as this one as well. So the coordination number is the number of bonds to the central metal ion. The dentate number is the number of points that the ligand can attach per ligand molecule. Uh, and the word ligand itself was our new vocabulary to start with today, and that's just the organic molecule that's attaching to the center transition metal ion. A quick run through of some shapes that you can get here, guys. Um, if you've got a coordination number of six, then it's octahedral. Coordination number four, they say you can get either of these two. I'll be honest with you, um, these aren't used much. In fact, none of these are used much. This one tends to be the, the vast majority, but... The SQ want you to be aware of that they can happen. So um, you get a nice linear shape here. Four can result in either square planar or a tetrahedral. They would have to give you some sort of clue because you don't know what situation causes which structure. Um, and I think that was as far as I wanted to go with this today. It's a relatively light one compared to previous times. Um, I do have a set of rules which let you name, oh I know what I'll do, I know what I'll do before we leave this behind, I'll show you how to write the formula version of this. How on earth do you show the formula of this? It's actually surprisingly easy. Um, you take the transition metal ion. In this case there's just one of them in the whole complex, there almost always is. 
Then after the transition metal ion symbol, you show the formula of your ligands. In this case, the ligands are all identical. So we'll put them in uh, round brackets and it's C2O4. And there are three of them. And that is the whole of the complex. So what we do is, for the first time ever, you're actually going to get to use a square bracket on your computer keyboard. Yay! How exciting! Because we put a square bracket around the outside of the complex. Everything in the square bracket is the complex. Everything outside the square bracket is not part of the complex. Lastly, of course, what charge is on this complex here? Well, on this one, you had a 3 plus, And you had 3 lots of 2 negative. Um, so that's 6 negative and 3 plus, which results in an overall charge for this complex as 3 minus. Um, the SQA, if you ever draw it, by the way, in an exam page, the SQA, I think, if I remember correctly, love you to put square brackets around the whole complex here as well. I, oh dear, sorry, that's bad layout. Um, and then the charge up here. So here's two different ways of representing this complex, guys. Um, I won't say the name of this complex because that's for the next video. There's a whole bunch of utterly pedantic and fl frankly ridiculous rules to come up with a nice name for this. Um, and if you fancy learning them, if you're the type that's got a sponge memory, you know, and you soak everything up the first time around, then congratulations. It's worth one mark in the final exam paper. But I'll go through it. I did not go through it with gun professional. Um, how would you write the formula for this one then? So the formula for this one would be Fe, again, and this time we have six water molecules. So H2O, six, oh, I'll close the brackets first, Dave, come on, man, be professional. Six of them, um, and the whole thing is fine, so we'll put the square brackets around it now. We have to work out the charge on this complex. Water is a neutral molecule, it has no charge, so therefore it's just going to be three plus and six lots of absolutely nothing, which means the charge is now three plus. So this is quite nice, actually. I'm glad I picked these. You would think I planned ahead for these lessons, eh? We've got an iron complex with a 3 minus charge, iron complex with a 3 plus charge. You can't have a jar of just 3 minuses, so you need a counter ion. We need some positive ions for this one, so say sodium. And of course, because sodium is 1 plus, you'll need 3 sodium ions to counter that 3 minus. And over here, we'll need a negative counter ion. Let's have it in lovely red. And uh, let's pick a chloride, for example. And chloride one minus, so you would require three of these too. And that actually is as far as I want to go with that. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye. What a muppet! I started this with a question: What does hemoglobin, uh, uh, chlorophyll, and shower shine have in common? And the answer is they are all complexes. They're all complexes. Uh, let me pause this, and I'll go and print a hemoglobin for you and a chlorophyll. Right here we have a, what is keeping us alive? Hemoglobin. Uh, this is the sort of proteiny version of it, but don't worry about that. We're interested in the central core of it, which is this heme molecule. Now, uh, that is, uh, got an iron ion, of course. That's why your blood's red. Uh, unless you're a spider, in which case it's based on copper. Um, and with an entirely different colour as well. Uh, for reasons that will come into next time, why does the ligand affect the colour that you see? Turns out that's crucial. Uh, but for the meantime, I wanted to know what they had in common. The answer is, this is a complex, hemoglobin. This is a complex as well. This is chlorophyll based on magnesium. Don't know if you can quite see that on the screen. It's quite nice. They've actually shown the arrows for the data bonds for these two bonds. And these two bonds are just normal. Um, and last of all, shower shine is got, has got EDTA in it. This is the ingredient in shower shine that wraps itself around calcium ions after you take a shower and it stops them drying on the surface of your glass, making it all cloudy. Just as a coincidence, by the way, as a wee uh, interest thing, the reason that human beings can be poisoned by the transition metal ions like mercury or cadmium, why are they so poisonous, ridiculously poisonous compared to other metals? And the answer is very simple, they interfere with your uh, proteins. Uh, transition metals are good at forming complexes, and you don't want the wrong complex to be formed with your proteins. Uh, and the other, on a slightly cheerier fashion, it turns out EDTA can be given to poisoning victims. If you've swallowed accidentally a large amount of lead ions, then they flood your stomach and your digestive system with high concentrations of effectively shower shine, 
<laughs> um, which wraps itself around the lead ions and stops them transferring through the membranes in your small intestines. So it traps the lead before it gets into your blood. How clever is that? Going to stop there, folks. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week.